Hello, everyone. Welcome to another capsule, international capsule for Shankar IAS Academy. Uh, today, we would like to discuss what is called the COP27, that is Conference of Parties number 27. Because I presume that all of you know what it means. This is a conference parties to the Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was adopted in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. Uh, and that was the pinnacle of achievement on the negotiations on climate change. Because before that, it was established that climate change is caused by greenhouse gas emissions. And these emissions have to be controlled uh, so that global warming does not take place and the uh, global situation changes to the disadvantage of humanity. It is also established that these greenhouse gases are caused by uh, human activities. There are several things that causes global warming, but um, human activity is one of the most important factors. This is disputed by some scientists, but now it is fairly established that bringing down greenhouse gas emissions is the only answer. So how to do it has been a matter of discussion since 1972 when the Stockholm Conference on uh, Environment was held, where Mrs. Gandhi laid down some of the very basic principles about climate change. Because the idea suggested in 1972 was that developing countries should keep away from development and not make the same mistakes as the developed countries did in order to save environment. But Mrs. Gandhi put it very bluntly when she said, poverty is the worst polluter. And the polluters must play, pay in the sense that developed countries have a special responsibility. And that debate has been going on till finally it was established that there is common but differentiated responsibility between developed countries and developing countries. This is the only issue which we have been discussing ever since in several forms the same principle and the question arise. And it happened also in COP27. Because each time the developed countries make a concession on this aspect, uh, another issue is raised. And therefore, it has been going in a, a, in a direction which does not take us anywhere. The fundamental point is, who will reduce greenhouse gas emissions? It was agreed in 1992 that the developed countries have a special responsibility and they took on a compulsory mandatory reduction. And at the same time, they authorized developing countries to increase their greenhouse gas emissions because without that, they cannot function. So technology and money should be given to the developing countries so that uh, they can also reduce their emissions without affecting their economic development. So this is the only issue really, but ever since the framework convention, the situation has been regressing, going backwards, moving away from agreements reached. Meanwhile, the temperature are rising to intolerable levels. This is the issue. And uh, in 1992, we thought that a solution was found that the mandatory cuts of the developed countries will help and developing countries will, give, will be given money and technology so that they don't create emissions themselves beyond their needs. So this was the agreement there. But since the COP1 in Berlin, of which I was uh, vice chairman, uh, the situation started regressing because developed countries moved away from the commitments that they made in Rio de Janeiro. And they started giving various excuses why they cannot reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Because it was a matter of maintaining their luxurious life. And uh, no reduction could be made because they must have their 12 air conditioners and four cars and various other gadgets, etc. And they were not willing to make any sacrifices on that account. And the developing countries could not have the projects they want, the electricity they want, the factories they want, because if environmental standards are established, they will not be able to 
do anything because the financing will not be available for them. The cost of financing an environment front friendly uh, you know, industry is much more than a regular industry. And the incremental cost has to be met by somebody, and that has to be developed countries. But this principle they have been moving away from, and they have been asking developing countries to do various things. But the whole thing, whole structure of Rio de Janeiro was changed, first in Copenhagen and later in the Paris Agreement. So I call the Paris Agreement a hoax at that time, because there was nothing in the Paris Agreement which would help the process established in Rio de Janeiro, because developed countries had moved away from implementing their mandatory cuts and developing countries were not given any money. It was supposed to be $350 billion, which was promised in Rio de Janeiro, which was reduced to $5 billion for 10 years in the World Bank. So it was a ridiculous situation. So finally, all the countries had agreed that this a uh, formula of uh, mandatory cuts will not work because they did not implement them. And their argument was the developing countries must also have mandatory cuts, which the developing countries could not afford. And finally, among about five or six leading countries, it was agreed that we changed the track. The track went up to what is called the Kyoto Protocol. And the Kyoto Protocol was uh, embodied all the elements of the Rio Declaration, uh, but the developed countries refused to sign it. And so it died a, died a natural death. So an alternative was uh, thought of, and that is how came the concept of voluntary cuts. That means everybody cuts voluntarily with a view to make sure that the global temperature does not go above 1.5 degrees Celsius. That was the heart of the of the Paris Agreement. So everybody gave their voluntary uh, emission cuts. And when it was all added up, it was discovered that the temperature of the globe will go by 3.5 degrees Celsius, not 1.5, which is the desirable level. So that means if you are above 1.5 degrees Celsius, then the world will begin to end because the lower level countries will disappear, more more floods and more drought and everything will come and maybe 200 years the earth will perhaps be unlivable. So what do you do about that? And so from uh, Paris up to Glasgow last year, uh, these ideas were tried out, so many safety valves were proposed, so many funding methodologies were proposed, but nothing came to the came to a solution which will uh, limit the global climate change or global warming uh, below 1.5 degrees Celsius. So we have already issued the death warrant for the, for the Earth by not fulfilling those promises. So the um, United States uh, walked out of uh, the Paris Agreement. All others tried to stay and then uh, U.S. government came back, but all that did not make any difference to the actual situation on the ground. And so uh, the world body, the United Nations uh, body is concerned, again changed track in Glasgow. In Glasgow, the change of track was that every country will declare uh, a target year for um, carbon-free emissions net carbon emissions in the sense that you can emit carbon, but you must do things in order to neutralize it through other methods by using other uh, fuels and other technology. So many countries have declared their uh, intention to be uh, carbon free by 2030, 2050, 2060, and India 2070. But all these countries at that time, all the develop, developing countries said, yes, these are our targets, but this is subject to financial support and also subject to technological support. And that is where it stayed. So people was, were thinking of uh, implementing the uh, understanding in Glasgow. And that is why the 27th COP, is in brief, the history of the 27th COP, 
to see how they can develop policies uh, which would fulfill the uh, voluntary years that countries have declared. India, for example, said we must have $1 trillion a year if we were to uh, uh, reach that stage by 2070. So nobody believes that that kind of money will be available. So um, the usual things happen, a lot of expectations, people are promising very many things. A lot of NGOs and others were on the streets. In fact, there are more uh, NGOs and activists on the streets than in the conference hall. The enthusiasm was also more outside than in the conference because the conference was dealing with the reality. So there was a concept of loss and damage uh, for the most affected countries. This has been in the air for some time, but that is not what the developing countries were seeking. Developing countries were seeking a kind of technology and funding which would enable them to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions and uh, reach the zero zero uh, carbon level. But uh, the developed countries, some of them just started this uh, debate on a, on, a, on a fund in order to, um, de to deal with the loss and damages caused by some of the countries. So this is then is removed, this moved away from uh, the original understanding. The idea was all developing countries must get assistance. But now they are making another category within that. Within that, the weaker countries, uh, countries with no hope of um, development unless they have assistance, unless they are able to have factories and other facilities. And therefore, they needed to uh, not only create new uh, greenhouse gas emissions, at the same time, protect themselves. There are various ways of doing it. You can build uh, bridges, you can build uh, uh, dams in order to you know, control uh, the climatic conditions and also uh, keep away from the dangers of flood or drought, etc. But this is happening all the time. We look at the period before COP27, this happened in many, many countries. So here again, I think the developed countries played a trick on the world community. So instead of promising funding for everyone, they started talking about loss and damage. Of course, uh, there was nothing wrong in that idea that we should certainly uh, compensate the poorer countries uh, to gain sustain and sustenance. But the bigger issue is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions globally. And uh, this uh, loss and uh, damage uh, funding which is proposed is not going to deal with it. So that is why I have said in my article in redif.com last week that uh, COP has done nothing in order to improve the situation on climate change. And most scientific experts are saying that this was uh, totally a loss of time. But there are always uh, people who would like to see the uh, silver lining on any dark cloud. And the only sir, sir, slide, uh, silver lining is that there is a promise of a new fund. So if this and, uh, a committee has been established to um, look into the formalities, to find out where the money will come from, um, how it will be distributed, which are the countries which are affected most, and all these uh, have been initiated. Who will give them technology? Who will give them money? All these have to be discussed. discussed. So what has happened is only so far that this idea has been accepted. And that too was accepted at the very last minute. And this is something that COP does all the time. When the time for the conference to end comes, normally there is no outcome. And then they turn the clock back because they cannot come they cannot postpone the conference. So what they do is they don't change the dates. They change on to the clock. And uh, even though two, two nights may be spent, it will all be on the day the clock was stopped so that uh, there is no, uh, the time lag does not affect the programs, etc. So the same thing has been done. Like it happened in uh, Glasgow, there was this issue of uh, coal, how to, phase out coal. And uh, finally, after several hours of discussion, 
face out became face down. And that was a compromise that India had suggested and everybody declared victory and then nothing happened. What has happened to Poland? Nothing at all. So a similar situation has arisen here also. Uh, the Secretary General said that this was the first step towards uh, climate justice because those who are um, suffered the most are being uh, compensated. Many people said there's a determined way forward. It will uh, go the same way, but in my view, it will go the same way as the other funds. There are so many funds, protect, proposed Planet Protection Fund, the Green Fund, so many funds were proposed, but no funds have come, no technology has come. There is more of hot air than anything else. So if those people who consider TO, COP27 a success will highlight the fact that there is a provision for a new funding, it depends on us what to do with it, how to raise it before COP28. That's what they are saying. But those who know the story from right from the beginning understand that uh, this is another ploy, another way to produce an atmosphere of progress, uh, but without any real progress. Because nobody has committed any money, nobody has given any timetable. Just say there's a fund, and for that fund, they have established some kind of a committee which will uh, decide all this and come back with uh, suggestions uh, uh, before the COP uh, 2028 uh, next year. So there is going to be a transitional committee. So in my view, this is a retrogressive step retro because now the uh, funding for the developing countries will be further divided for those who are uh, have been damaged or uh, loss, sustained losses, and others who may not have immediately sustained any loss, but also in a way, in a way, looking towards the opportunity to resolve the problem. So, right from '92 till today, there is no viable program to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Nor do we have a credible program uh, to give funding and technology to developing countries. These are the issues. But these issues have not been addressed, addressed in a peculiar way by saying that uh, as far as the reduction of greenhouse gases is concerned, we go by the years established by different countries. And we know very well that they are not going to implement it. And therefore, let us address the other issue, loss and damage. So a lot of uh, you know, questions were asked. The developed countries kept promising and developing countries kept questioning. And finally, at the last minute, after the day of the end of the conference had passed, this decision was taken. And I think that this also will go the same way as the many other funds are concerned. Because the idea that developed countries should change their lifestyles and enable developed countries to develop with the resources that they make available, so that the poverty which is the worst polluter is removed. And those who have polluted the earth, that is the developed countries, must pay for it. A principle that was accepted in 1992. So in so many years of discussions and debates, we still have not found a solution. And unless there is a change of heart among the developed countries to change their lifestyles and to adapt new lifestyles and new technology so that they don't consume all the resources that the earth has, in order to enrich themselves. So it's a, it's a major, major issue. And uh, COP27 has not solved this issue. It has diverted attention from the main issue of climate change, climate change reduction and also funding and technology by creating a new fund, which does not even exist as of now. So this is what has happened at COP27. Lots of speeches were made. President Biden himself spoke about the need for climate change control. Everybody, developed countries and developing countries spoke very emotionally, effectively. And the young people, uh, you know, people who are committed to the cause of uh, uh, climate change, they asked the present generation, are you forgetting us? Are you going to forget us? You will pass away. And we are the people who will have to suffer the losses caused by climate change. And so they keep saying this generation is making a very grave mistake, not doing anything about it, because they are passing on the responsibility to the next generation 
and generation after next, which will be gravely affected by all these problems. So the present conferences, the present governments have to act. And that is a demand. And from outside, I have seen personally in, uh, in Berlin, where the NGOs, uh, you know, got into the conference when they announced, when their results were announced, they invaded the conference hall and threatened delegates that they will do something in order to push them to take decisions. And finally, it was great difficulty that all of us appealed to them uh, not to disrupt the conference. So the, the, the anger is burning outside and that is being expressed by the young people. So this kind of idea of a fund or some some kind of a ploy is not going to change the uh, opinion of the people. And as far as developed countries are concerned, they are emitting greenhouse gases to maintain their luxury. And they would like to stick to that. They are not going to change that. So you cannot expect any outcome there. And the uh, developing countries have to stop development in order to survive because they do not have funds to use it for environment-friendly technology. So there were no money is available there. And uh, that cost of uh, even giving some support to the most affected countries, uh, the estimate of the United Nations Environment Program is as much as $580 billion by 2050. Immediately 160 to $340 billion every year in order to pay for the loss and damage of the poorer countries. So where is it going to come? It's not going to come at all. So we have to look for another formula, another solution for COP29, because COP28 will review this and discover that this has been of no great help. So particularly to the young people, we do not know what to say, because the present generation of uh, deal makers, decision makers have to take the bull by the horns and uh, reduce emissions by changing lifestyles and reduce emissions in developing countries by adopting new technologies for which they need them. So it always comes down to the dollar finally. And that has to be found. And that can be done only by sacrifice by the developed countries, which they will not do because they need their. Uh, luxury emissions and develop, developing countries cannot stop all their development activities because what they have is uh, survival emissions. So this conflict cannot be resolved. And the only hope, in my opinion, the only hope is that we develop technologies sufficiently in order to capture the carbon from the atmosphere and do something with it. Such research is going on in many countries, but does not reach any conclusion. If you have a technology by which something, some uh, bomb-like thing will go into the atmosphere, and get this collected in some way, in a liquid form or solid form, and bring back to the earth and maybe you know, bury it somewhere or turn them into useful products. And that's not very far, uh, maybe five years, 10 years, like in the case of nuclear energy. The fusion energy is very much in the making. But after many years, we have not reached anywhere near conclusion of that. So similarly, a scientific exercise will probably be the final solution. But in the meantime, the politicians have a job, the diplomats have a job. So we'll go on creating new institutions uh, new pa new uh, all of the, the products, uh, new kind of uh, uh, quality of life, so kind of diff same different kind of uh, responsibilities. All this will work out. But I think eventually, since luxury has to be maintained and survival has to be ensured, I do not see an easy formula to develop unless there is a scientific solution. Thank you.